Ski with Midwest Native Skills, and we're back again for our live stream every other Thursday evening at 7 o'clock. Today we've changed it up a little bit. Uh, we have a guest here today, and uh, we're going to be covering uh, basically three things. Um, one is uh, tips and tricks on the bow drill. Uh, remember, you have to submit your uh, uh, video clips in. Uh, the competition ends next Thursday. And all the uh, rules and instructions are on Facebook or they're on our website, which is survivalschool.com. So we're going to first go over some uh, tips to, uh, for you to get a bow drill fire a little quicker. Uh, then Rob came up a few years back with, a, with some modifications to the notch in the fireboard, which works both for a hand drill and a bow drill. And uh, he's going to go over that and give you all the details on that. And then he's going to go over a new fire light called a drop log fire light. I've used it a few times. It works great. It's quick. It can be used in a home fireplace or when you're out camping. Uh, it's a pretty cool system, so uh, I think you, you'll enjoy that. Uh, so I'm just going to give Rob's professional background. I've known Rob for 30 years now, at least. At least. So that's why I don't get it wrong. Uh, Rob is a clinical research manager of, a, of the section of respiratory care at the Cleveland Clinic. And he's also an adjunct professor at Case Western Reserve University. Rob's uh, written several books on respiratory care. He's got a quite uh, distinctive uh, resume here. But I'm going to let him tell you how he uh, got into primitive skills and a little bit about that because that's what you're probably interested in. Yeah, well, um, I've been interested in primitive skills and Native American survival arts since I was a little kid, uh, 8, 10 years old. But in those days, there weren't resources to learn about survival. There weren't any books. Um, we're talking about the late 50s, early 60s. There was nothing. I mean, you go to museums. And you go to libraries and you get things that were totally impractical. Yep. Uh, so it wasn't up until I was in my late 20s, I guess, when uh, the movement towards uh, Native American skills and survivalism started to pick up. We started to see some books come online. Uh, the, the outdoor school, older mm -hmm. outdoor school came into, uh, yep. into play. And I started reading books about it and I got interested in uh, Tom Brown's book. Okay. Tracker series, you know? mm -hmm. and I was just enthralled with what he had done and, and the lifestyle that he had lived with his uh, Apache Indian mentor, and uh, so I decided to go and sign up for his classes. And took several classes, and uh, at one point I was uh, I got kind of advanced, and I was even a teacher's assistant once or twice, and I was really into it. So when I came back home to Northeast Ohio, <clears throat> like I can't remember how this happened, but I stumbled into a group of people who were students of Tom's. And they call themselves the Dirt Time Group, right? Yeah, remember that? I remember that. That's how I ran into you. Yep. And uh, we would go out on the weekends and practice in the parks of these schools that we were in. And, uh, and then you and I started uh, getting more involved. Yeah. Yeah. We would travel around the country to different specialized instructors. We yep. saw Charles Warsham for yeah. fire making yeah. for like 10 days. Nothing but fire making. Nothing but fire. Yep. And then uh, I went to see Ron Hood. Out in the Sierra Nevadas for 10 days and primitive skills and various other uh, instructors. And then you put together your own school. And yeah. I guess the rest, the rest is history, huh? Yeah, I guess so. What Rob really brings to this is, as you can tell by his professional background, he's a scientist, he's very analytical. So he takes the primitive skills and kind of tweaks them a little bit with a science background and puts some science behind it and actually improves on them. Yeah, like you, I'm an engineer in my background, so yeah. bringing those kinds of skills yeah. and, the, and the ability to write to the table, I think, really helps a lot. It, it helps you analyze. Yeah. So, I told you about the competition they have, and uh, there's some people out there that have done the bow drill and flint and steel. Uh, we gave some tips on flint and steel about kicking on the edge and, and striking down, uh, but the bow drill seems to you know get most people, so I thought we'd give them a few tips on... If somebody's doing it, how you can help someone. Yeah. And if someone has to help you do the bow drill, that doesn't mean you can't win the competition. So don't think you have to do it all on your own. If, uh, we take everything into account when we're going to be doing the analysis. So. And uh, the bow drill is not as simple as it seems. And it's like everything else. If someone teaches you, if you have a mentor, that's the key to everything in life, I think. Because 
when I was a kid, I remember reading some things about it and practicing, but never knowing exactly what to do. I remember one time my dad and I were playing around. We got so frustrated, we, we, we chucked a piece of pine dowel into a drill. <laughs> Tried to bore it into another it work. So good. It didn't work so good, no. And the same thing with the hand drill. When I got older and I started actually reading the skills about how to do a hand drill, I got close, but nothing happened until I went to um, Tom Brown School and one of his mentors just sat down with me and showed me. He did a tendon and a hand drill. Uh -huh. Got it just like that. And it, something just clicked. You know, you know how that works. When you see it, it puts something in your head. Uh, with the rubbing two sticks together, just yesterday I had the TV on and there was the flip. Fred Flintstone cartoon, and he was rubbing two sticks together, and this is how everybody thinks. He was there, he was, you know, doing this, and... Uh, well, that actually works, that's a fire song, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a fire song, but not quite like not that. Quite, not quite like that. Sure, do we have anybody uh, online to ask any questions? Yeah. Well, Chris Tahersky is on the line. Chris Tahersky! Welcome, Chris. Thanks for joining in. Oh, happy anniversary and belated birthday. He's an old friend of mine from school. We have stories, war stories to tell you. Anyone else? Okay. Well, let's get down and uh, give people some tips and tricks on the bow drill. I have one here. Uh, the first trick I just want to show people is how to put this the uh, spindle in. So again, you're holding. I'm right-handed. So you're holding the bow in the right hand, you take your spindle, pointy side up, the flatter side down. So this is how I'm going to be bowing, this is how the spindle's going to be. So you take the spindle, dive it down into, in between the cord and the bow, catch it, and then leverage it up, and it should be that tight. So again, take your spindle like this, dive it down, catch the top, and leverage it up. How about okay. if you come up here and show them? How's this? Better? Mm -hmm. Like this, dive it down, catch it, and leverage it up. So that's the bow. And you'll notice that the bow is not like a, a bow and arrow bow. It doesn't flex in this case. So something has to flex. It's either going to be your cordage or your bow. Right. In this case, he's made a nice bow. What does it have? Oh. So it doesn't bend, that doesn't have to because he's using paracord, which gives just enough you know, to do that. And that's a trick. If you ever make one of these with natural cordage, that's not going to give. So you have to have the sure. bow give. So the bow, in that case, should be made ideally out of hickory yep. or something that's got some Okay, Rob, can you get down there and you can be a, a new student at this? I'm going to try to remember all the things I've seen people do wrong. Okay. Well, first of all, so like, I'm right-handed, should I go like this? Yeah. Or should I go like this? Well, if you're right-handed, you put that foot up. Yeah, because you want to have this action go in here, right? Yep. So now do I want to go like this, or do I want to go like this, or does it matter? Or? Go right next to your body. So it's this way, right next to your body. You want to put your foot, and you're going to pick the hole you're going to use. So let's pick uh, this, uh, this hole right here. Okay. So you put there, you put the arch of your foot on the arch right close to the hole. Good. I like to keep it up as close as I can without burning a hole in my <laughs> Yeah. Especially if you have shoelaces. Yeah. You want to take this extra cord and kind of wrap it around so it doesn't get in your way. I always like to put extra cord on all the bow drills I sell online. So in case they ever need to extend it, still have some extra cord. Okay. So here we got this. Hold it at the back and then hold the handhold. We can use a wooden handhold here. Right like that. Okay. You know, this is what I saw one, in fact, you and I were together one time, and we, we watched a, a famous instructor do it like this. He was way back like this, yeah. and he was way out like this. And it doesn't and, and He did it, but he must have taken tremendous strength and, yeah. and time to do that. It's better if you keep your shoulder right above the, the spindle. Most important part, I think, is keep your wrist locked into your shin. Now, if you're new to this, a lot of times your wrist is going to wobble and that spindle is going to go flying. So what I can do to help Rob is hold it like this. And then he can 
to spin it and it would be a lot easier for him to bolt. It's binding up there. Okay, let's see why. It's binding. I hope, let's, let's flip the hole. I'll try that one. And it doesn't matter if the notch is going to the back or to the front. In my experience, anyways. And now you don't want to have the bow um, anything but parallel to the ground. Because if you go like this, it'll light up. If you go like this, it's going to so You want to try to keep it parallel to the ground. Long, steady stroke. Now we're not going to make a fire here because Cheryl will get a little upset with us. Now, if I can pull this in, then Rob can use all of his horsepower and muscle to keep this going. Now, if he gets tired after a while, I can do this, and I can grab the bolt here, and we can do this. Keep going, and actually we're getting smoke out of here. Did, did you hear that sound change? Now we're actually making the job. And now when you see this dense stuff, you know you're actually doing something good. When you see this, if you can give 10 more strokes, and then see what we have. We better not make a fire because Cheryl will get upset with us, yeah, especially this is, on this tile. Yeah, this is why I don't have carpet anymore. We got a coal. Hey. Well, we do have a coal. That's uh, not good. Let's get this up before we burn the tile. We used to have carpeting in here, Rob. Mm -hmm. But... <clears throat> Just and now you don't have to panic and do anything. Just let it take your time. Can you? Am I in frame? Huh? Oh yeah. Yeah, they can see it. <laughs> now I like to wait and blow it until I actually see the red hot coal. Oh yeah, you can see. At it. this point, you can put coal extender on there too. If you yep. Have chaga or other types of material. I don't need to burn up your bio there, Rob. <laughs> More of that thing. Okay. Okay. So, those are some tips and tricks on the bow drill. Uh, something I've noticed in classes that people fail to do. Before every attempt, re-point the top and flatten out the bottom of the spindle. I call that redressing. Uh, you can test tightness if you hold the spindle uh, stationary. Okay, so you put the spindle in, hold the spindle stationary, and try to move the bow back and forth. If you can move the bow back and forth, it'll be slipping on the spindle. It's too loose. It should be tight so you physically can't move it. So those are just some tips and tricks. Can I show them my uh, hand drill, my, uh, my hand holding my... Yeah, why don't you do that? Yep. One of the difficult things in making a, a bow drill setup is the hand hold itself. And it's hard to find the right materials, and if it's not um, bored out properly, you can get a little of your thing. So there are various ways that um, you can use hand holds for training purposes, like Tom likes to use shot glasses with tape wrapped around them. But I have designed a little thing that's always with me. Basically, this is a Victorinox, I think it's a Woodsman variety of um, holding knife. And I've taken off one of the bolsters here, they're just made out of plastic. And I've replaced it with about a quarter inch thick piece of aluminum into which I've bored a divot. So that's my handhold. It's always with me, with almost zero friction. And that's a really good. Uh, a little tool, a little tip to make. So you carry that with you, you have an extra knife, you have all the tools on there, yeah. plus you have your ready-made handle. Yeah. There's two or three different ways to make a fire just in this one little knife pouch. Okay. That's one thing we say in class, you know, um, if you're going to carry something in your survival kit, can it be used for more than one yeah. thing? Yeah. And if it can, it's worthwhile carrying with you. It's a good mental exercise. So, uh, that's the tips and tricks we have. If you have any other questions about bow drill, write them in. Um, 
We'll do our best to answer them. We don't have any questions, but Connie's on. Hi, Connie. And Ruthie. Ruthie from Canada? Uh-huh. Welcome, Ruth. Cody? It's been a while. We've been, we've been threatening to go back up to Canada. My yeah. friends up in Canada, they, they had a lodge up there, and uh, we had a lot of good times at that lodge. Cody's on, too. Cody, my nephew. Okay, Rob. Uh, Want to tell us about this notch you came up with? Yeah, this is... Um, for a long time, I was really fascinated with hand drills. Mm -hmm. Because, as you know, it takes more skill to do it. <coughs> but once you have the skill... You better tell me what hand drill is. Somebody out there might not know. Um, do we have something to show? Uh, we don't, but we have your fire board. And uh, why don't we mimic a pool cue as the weed stalk? It would be much shorter than this. Okay. Well, first of all, the hand drill has essentially the same fire board, and we're going to talk about that in detail in a minute. But uh, instead of a bow and a drill and a handle, you simply have usually a stalk of weed just as a single thing. And it usually is between the tip of your finger and your elbow in length, something along those lines. It should be about the diameter of your little finger, something along that line. And um, you can, the, the best um, spindles are, are things like maybe uh, white uh, willow, dry white willow. You can use, um, mullein is a very good one. Uh, if you have yucca, if you're not part of the country, you have yucca is wonderful, both for the spindle and the fireboard. Around here we have teasel. Around here we have teasel. That's with that, uh, people get teasel and thistle confused. Teasel has that brown head this time of year. It's real prickly, so if you see that brown head, that's teasel. And that head is often used in coats of arms in, in Europe, so it's, right. it's a very famous plant. Be aware that teasel now, <clears throat> unlike um, both teasel and mullein, they have hollow stalks, mm -hmm. which is fine. But you gotta watch in both of those, some plants have very thin walls. And all that does is drill a hole right through the board. If that's what you're going to do, it's fine. But if you want to do a fire, make sure that the wall of the stock is probably at least a quarter of an inch, I would say. And yeah. the thicker the better. Yeah. It just depends on you know, the growth environment. Try it. If it works, you got it. If not, try a new stock. But, so, so this is too long for the stock, but what you do is you would put your fire board down there, just like with a bow drill, and you take your hands and you're spinning the, the weed stock back and forth at the same time putting downward pressure on it. So eventually when you're doing this, your hands eventually go down the board and then you have to come back up to the top and keep going down. And there are plenty of YouTube videos of people who are yeah. expert at doing this. And there's even a technique called floating where you don't even move your hands up and down. It's an advanced level to do that. So that's the hand. And, and the, the foot position is, is usually different too. I like to just sit down like this with my fire board under my foot and get over top of it like this. With, I can do with this talking about this. But other people like to stand up or, you know, like as Tom is kneeling. Yep. That is very highly um, individualistic. But the fire board becomes a little bit more critical because if the dimensions aren't just right, then it, it's, uh, it's a lot harder to get a coal. So what I found in experiment is that um, you want the fireboard to be the right size relative to the spindle. So you want the fireboard to be thin. You can notice this is much thinner than what we had before. Yeah. You want this to be about two thirds or half the diameter of the spindle. So this, the spindles are smaller and they're, they're more fragile. So you want to proportion the fireboard that way. Also, you'll notice that we were using a very simple notch. It's just a V-shaped notch. Nothing special about that. And, and for a large uh, spindle like this, it doesn't matter much. But when you have a smaller spindle, particularly when it's hollow, then the shape of the notch becomes important. And if you notice on this notch here, for example, it's got this weird sort of notched out shape going towards the bottom. And I'll explain that in detail, why that is. But essentially what you want in a notch for a hand drill is you want the coals to be compacted as they form and not just spill out because there's not going to be as many of them as certainly as a big board like that. Right. And you want them um, uh, to stay compact and so that when you pull the board away, you don't disturb them. Because sometimes they get hung up on the sides of the notch. And you only have a very small notch, you can't afford to have anything go wrong. 
And the other thing is, if you create a notch that sort of flares out at the bottom like this, then as you're drilling down, the surface area that is contacting the drill gets smaller and smaller. So for the same um, downward force, you have a higher pressure. So as the board is, is warming up, you don't have as much pressure, as much heat. And then as it drills down, you get smaller and smaller contact area with the spindle, and that increases the pressure, and that increases the heat, and it increases the efficiency of the whole system. I told you he was smart. That's the engineering. <laughs> so, uh, just so you know, in engineering terms, pressure is force per unit area. So if the area is smaller for the same downward force, higher pressure, higher heat. Higher heat? Quicker coal. Quicker that's, coal. that's what we're interested in. More, more coal. reliable coal. All right, so how do you do this? Well, you start off with a board that is about, uh, again, <clears throat> about twice the width as your spindle, and about a half uh, of the spindle's diameter for the thickness, half to two, a third, something, two thirds like that. So that's generally the size of the board. And then what you do is, I'll bring these little diagrams up here so you can see them. Is this good? You can go around the side and you can see the picture if you want. Yeah, I can't read the writing as much, That's but I can right. see the diagram. Mm -hmm. So here's your um, fire board. And the first thing you do is you lay your, the end of your spindle, which is going to be flat. It's not going to be rounded like we showed here. It's just going to be flat. And you put it on the edge and you mark the diameter of the spindle on the board. You can do it with a pencil, you can do it with a knife, anything, a piece of coal. Yeah. And then, that's your first uh, reference mark. Then what you do is, you put your spindle right on top of that. In this case, I'm showing a round circle because, so just a there, because it is a, um, a hollow spindle. So you put uh, the spindle, you center it on this line here, and then you draw a line through the middle so that you have a cross right in the middle of that. So that's going to be the center of your drill down piece. And then you draw a couple of other index lines. You put one on, on the side, on the outside of the spindle, and the other one on the outside of the spindle. These are both parallel lines that are perpendicular to this line and parallel to the middle line. So now you have three lines going this way and one going through the middle, and you have these like crosshairs in the middle. And you'll notice that you want to carry these lines down to the edge of the board. Now I know this is starting to sound complicated, but <laughs> it's not that bad once you get, it, get used to it. You want to carry those lines, again, this is the side of the board. You want to carry them down to the bottom of the board. And you want to measure with your knife or something um, on the, this line where the uh, center of that circle is from the top. So you would measure this distance and you lay it out on this distance and that then becomes the um, center of the bottom which is just underneath the center of the top. And then once you have these index lines drawn, you draw another line here. And that is the vertex of the, these little angles that come out here. So you connect these lines. And you have this center line keeping you um, in place. So just to review that, I put B and C together here. So this is the top of the board. These are your index lines going across the top, down the side, down the side, and across to the bottom. So what you want to get is this sort of diamond-shaped thing happening here. And why you want to do that is because the next step is to put your spindle on there and actually burn it in. So you burn a hole in there. In this case, I have a, a filled in one. You could do this for a solid spindle or a hollow spindle. Get your burn-in hole first. And then after you do that, just like you would with a bow drill, then you take your knife and you carve out this notch. So you carve a line from about here to the center, to this edge of this, carry it down through here, and then you can carve out this little notch. So it looks a little bit difficult to see from this drawing. There is a, uh, an article that I wrote about this. All the instructions are in the article. The article is posted on Tom's web, website. So anyways, you cut out uh, a notch from these lines, and what you get is this. So here's the top, here's the side flaring out, and the bottom, can you see that? Yeah. And the bottom becoming a notch in the center here. So that when you burn through, if you were to go all the way through, it would just get a big hole. These are actual notches that I use to start fires. So you can see this was a, a hollow um, um, spindle, 
and it carved a circular hole and it didn't go all the way through but the coals then were formed in this notch that's downward facing compacted <laughs> there you go compacted and you get a nice little coal right in this area right here so that's basically it um, really you have to read the article to get a full appreciation of why you do it this way and uh, I hope that works out for you and give us some feedback if you try feedback and this is the kind of instruction you get if you ever take a class with us so it's not just go out there and make a fire we uh, we tell you the whys and what for what's nice it does make a hand drill much easier to get a coal you can also use those same tricks on the bow drill sure. and it'll make it easier for you to get a bow drill fire too so, Absolutely. so uh, Rob came up with, with all that design as you can tell and uh, it works. It really does. Uh, and he also came up with this new fire lay that I'm really excited to share with everybody because when I saw it, I go, Rob, is this going to work? <laughs> and, sure. First of all, um, as you probably know, there are as many different ways to lay a fire as there are people to show you how to do it. I'll take it um, I have a fireplace in my house like Tom does. I have a lot of split wood and, and I burn in the fireplace all, all year long. And I wanted a, a simple uh, and reliable way to make a fire in the fireplace. And it turns out that it works in the woods as well. Now I have um, split go. wood. There we go. And basically these are quarters, quarter pieces of logs that I have faced uh, about a hand width apart. Face to face, these are flat faces that are touching each other. And in here I have some uh, tinder. In this case, it's just crumpled up paper. And the second, second figure. Second one is the blue one, I think, with the this one. Uh, the sticks on top. This. Yeah, well, this one didn't come out quite so good. And what you do is you just lay some sticks across the top. Now this could be any kind of sticks. This is basically your kindling. I just had some split wood that was very about the size of my little finger. And as you can see, it, it doesn't take very much. And so one of the advantages of this fire lay, uh, and there are several, is that it doesn't take much tinder and it doesn't take much kindling to get it going. So just a small handful of tinder and kindling can light these massive logs. So now we then... So once you've done that, then you lay another log on top of all of that, and you're ready to go. And essentially what happens is you... You get your source of fire, it could be a coal, it could be anything, and you stick it on one end so that you have plenty of room on one side, and you stick it on one end, it catches the tinder, the tinder then starts to burn, and it catches the two faces. So your hand was yeah. in the <laughs> Yeah, it catches the two faces of, of these logs because they're close enough they can form the heat. And then what happens is the fire then moves along the faces of these logs because they're close enough to reflect the heat, it starts burning these logs, or these little tinder sticks, as you can see here. And then at some point, one of them, or two of them, it's going to um, burn through and the log drops. That's why it's called a drop log fire. And eventually, of course, the whole thing will catch fire and, and this top log will drop down in between the other two logs. And what you get in, in the process, you get a really beautiful fire that's self-managing. You don't have to keep feeding it. So this will go for, these logs like this will go anywhere from two to four hours without any maintenance whatsoever. And as the top log burns down into coals, what you have left then is these two side ones left with a bunch of coals in the middle. And guess what? You throw a little grate on top of that and then you start, you're starting to cook. Can you explain what tinder is again for those people that haven't joined us before? Yeah. Um, Fuel, well, any fire requires three ingredients, right? It requires fuel, yep. requires oxygen, it requires heat. Now, fuel in particular has three grades. We call it tinder, which is the finest material, something like a bird's nest, something like this. This is jute, right? Right. Something it looks just like uh, the inner bark of a cedar tree, too. Right. Or mm -hmm. right. That's right. Inner barks of trees, uh, you can mix that in with something like cattail down or... Um, thistle down, um, and the idea is to go from smaller, very small diameter fibers to larger and larger diameter fibers. And then you get two sticks that are the size of your 
of your little finger maybe or smaller, these would be considered uh, kindling. So the heat from the burning tinder then catches this, the next layer up, and then you go to finger sticks that are the size of your finger, then the size of your wrist, and you finally get to something like this, which you would probably call fuel at that point. Tinder, kindling, and fuel. Different put one ways. together right here? <laughs> yeah, let's put one together. Just where they can see it. Bear on the floor around the table here, sir. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Whatever you want to do. Let's do it for. Do the fire, man. Well, I'm using split wood, but as I said, um, it will work with round logs as well. So you can just take your saw into the woods and saw with logs that are about this diameter and it'll still work. So you want to put these parallel and about, I don't know, maybe three fingers apart. And, and that spacing is rather critical because if it's too close, you don't get enough air. Uh, but if it's not close enough, you don't get enough heat reflected. Can you turn it this way so we can see that? Perfect. Yeah. Something like that. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Uh -huh. A little bit wider than a quarter, but about... Yeah. Something like two or three fingers. Yeah. My fingers. <laughs> two fingers on mine. Three's a little wide. Okay, good. Okay, now the next thing you want to do is put in some tinder. And as, a, as I've found, you don't have to fill up this whole space with tinder. You just need to put some at the end. And you put it at the end because it's more convenient to come in here with your coal, like Tom had a few minutes ago or a match or anything else, any, any source of ignition, you stick it right here. And then this will flame up, it'll catch these two faces on fire, and that fire will then naturally travel down the rest of the face. Now what you do is you fill in with um, some small sticks. The more you have, the better, of course. But I found that you could get away under the right conditions. You can get away with just two fat sticks, amazingly enough. If you can get the faces of these two logs to... I like to stack the deck in my favor. Yeah. So if you can get more sticks, depends on the situation, if, how bad you need this fire. Exactly. So you want to have most of this right over top of your tinder so that it's going. And you would continue like that down to the rest. And then you put relatively larger ones at the end like this. Now why you do that is because these naturally are going to take longer to burn through. Mm -hmm. And what you want is the faces of these two um, base logs to be on fire and to be cooking this guy on top so that by the time these guys, these supports burn through, this will be on fire, these will be on fire, this drops right down inside there. And, and then you have a beautiful little self-feeding fire that will eventually give you a nice bed of coals between these two supports and you lay your fire grill on top of that and you cook away. Nice. And cool. even if you're not going to cook, I do this all the time simply because it makes a beautiful fire and I don't have to mess with it. I light it, walk away four hours later, it's done. Pretty slick. Mm -hmm. I have the fireplace set up. Hate to put you on the spot though, but let's see if we can get it going in here. All right. I'll give you a hand, and uh, this would be a great time to write in any questions. Anybody else online that I should say hi to, Cheryl? Terry's on the phone. Hang on. Terry, your cousin. Who? Your cousin. Cousin Terry, hello. Thanks for joining us again. I, uh, Terry and I are talking about getting a survival class down in West Virginia sometime in the spring, so we just have to pick out some dates, and uh, uh, she's got the location, I understand, so we, we plan to do that. Probably, they're a little warmer than us, so maybe March or early April would be a good time. Now, one thing, you use a grate. I don't use a grate in my right. fireplace. So that's gonna be a little bit problematic because it's all off the ground. We can take it out. Will it come out? Sure. Uh, yeah, I think it'll be better. So, um, like I said, uh, if you wanted to submit any, uh, it doesn't have to be professional grade uh, uh, videos for the competition. Again, we're going to have one for flint and steel, 
one for children, people under uh, 12, I believe it's 12 and under. And that's one category in flint and steel for anyone over 12. Then we have bozo competitions, under 12, and adult over 12. And like I said, uh, we're not looking for who can do it the fastest, but more looking for who can do it the smoothest, who can explain the tender they have, do it fluidly uh, with the bow drill. Again, we're going to be looking for bowing level to the ground, having that wrist locked into the shin, having that top arm steady, and breathing. It sounds funny, but when you're doing that bow drill, it's easy to, to forget to breathe. I see a lot of people just hold their breath unconsciously. Yeah. And they get out, they get winded immediately, they don't understand. It's a lot to keep track of. You have to keep your balance, keep track of here, your bowing, and your focus. So listen for that sound change. Once you get a little more comfortable with it, I think I mentioned the sound change when we were doing the knife sharpening. When the sound changes, you know it's time to go to the next stone and it sounds smoother. Well here, you get a little squeaking sound and then when that sounds like more of a grinding sound, you know you're actually making wood dust. Because you have to get that wood dust up to 780 degrees before it actually starts glowing red hot. So you need to make the wood dust, and then you have to create the heat, which is transferred to that wood dust in that notch. So it's a, it's a little process. Now, we could have started this with a coal, but we're going to use the old big lighter trick. Okay. Rob, you the honors? All right, keep your fingers crossed. Nothing ever works when you're demonstrating, right? Especially indoors. Flu's open. A lot of times, if fire is struggling, you need to add oxygen. So sometimes you need to just blow on it a little bit. You know that because it's smoke. So it, for your video contest, it's not about the fastest. Then it's not really about the fastest. It's an overall. If somebody, if somebody under twelve. Um, has help and they're smooth with it and they just it's the overall feel of it so you need to get a coal and you need to blow that coal into flame and then you need to have some kind of little fire lay there it could be Rob's it could be a teepee fire lay it could be any kind of fire lay but we want to see you transfer it into that so it's kind of a all-encompassing uh, competition because in a real-life situation just getting a coal isn't enough. You need to transfer that into a, a fire. Now, I don't, I'm not sure if people know that smoke is just unburnt wood. That's why when you have smoke um, and a flame uh, comes up, it actually burns the smoke. And if there's too much, it means there's not enough oxygen. You got it. Now we're a little enclosed here. The key here is that the two faces of those logs that are flat, parallel to each other, need to catch fire for this to work. If it's too far apart and that doesn't happen, then you're going to have problems. And just from doing fire for 30 years, Rob, I can see that this is starting to catch. Mm -hmm. And I can see from here, if the camera angle isn't seen it, but there's, there's flames on the facing sides of those logs. And that's what you need. And, that's what, and you notice you don't have to fill this all up with anything. It'll, it'll migrate down there by itself. So you can serve on your, your tinder and kindling if you're in short supply. Yeah, now you can see it, right? Yep. There's something just mesmerizing about a fire, you know? Yeah. Especially in the fall. Yeah, something that everybody can relate to. Yep. That's why in the classes I always ask the question, fire is important, but what's the most important thing a fire is going to do for you in a survival situation? So I asked that question out there. Somebody want to type in, what's the most important thing a fire is going to do for you in a survival situation? Let's see if we can get some interaction with yeah. the people out there. Let's hear that. That's good. While we're watching the fire. Hint, hint. <laughs> <laughs>
No one's writing in. Come on, you know what's the most important thing. Will we get the messages on here? Yeah, we will. Okay. No one knows what the most important thing is. Calmness. Who? Calmness. Calmness. We have a winner on the very first. It's going to calm you down. West. Who, who? Weston Roberts. Weston. Psychological benefits. Okay, we'll sit down here. Rob, I think you got a success here. Well, there you go. Yeah, but that's exactly what a fire will do. It'll, uh, it's for mental attitude. Now, if you've taken a survival class and you have a plan, I'm not too worried about it. If you have a plan, you know you're going to do shelter, fire, water, and food in that order. And uh, you should be somewhat prepared. It's the person with you that maybe didn't have a class. They're going to be freaking out because they're lost. And by you verbally telling them, oh, don't worry, things will be okay, it won't work. So the best thing to do is get a fire and have them break up sticks, give them a task to do that's safe. But once you have a fire, it just calms the whole situation down. And then it'll do all those other things like purify water, signal, keep animals away, keep you warm, cook the food. All Brenton says morale. Morale. That's it. Brenton's right. Morale. Then it makes this being lost in the woods kind of like a cabin trip. And that's what it's all about. So, um, this is starting to look like an artificial fire now. It's so pretty. It does. It was yeah. very symmetrical and uh, balanced, and you don't have to fiddle with it. And literally, how long did it take you to pick up that handful of sticks? Yeah. A minute or two? That's the beauty of this fire light, because literally a handful of sticks this big, how long is it? You can get that sitting on the ground. It's rushing around. Now, the only thing is those two you put down that are split, and... Uh, if you have an axe or any kind of cutting tool, or you, you can, can just uh, baton your, your knife. Yeah. So I've found that um, this size of log is good. You can use slightly smaller logs. If you get much smaller, if you get them this size of your wrist, I've tried to do that. It's not enough fuel to make this work real well. Okay. So I haven't had good success, but I've had good success with this size and with logs as big as this. But that might be difficult to, to, to split in the woods if right. you don't have an axe. Right. Um, and, and again, like I said, you can do this with logs this size that are round. You can do it exactly the same way. If they're dry enough, it'll work. You don't have to split them at all. You don't have to split them. If you do, I think it's a little more sure that you'll get it. Right. But I've done it without splitting them. So Wendy wants to know which are the best fire lights. <laughs> oh! Depends on who you ask. Depends on what you ask. I say this is the best. <laughs> I wonder why. I wonder why. Well, I'll go first. Uh, I like all around in all conditions the teepee fire lake. Now it takes a little while to build, but my rationale is um, if it's raining out and you get the teepee fire lake, if it's tall and skinny, what you your tinder goes to the bottom. So when that burns, heat goes up. It's preheating the wood above it. Remember, I said the wood has to get to 780 degrees. When you get the first layer of sticks, you put a second layer and a third layer. That third layer is actually an umbrella or protection on the inner sticks, keeping the inner sticks dry. So you have the benefit of preheating the wood once you get a fire inside and keeping it, it dry as long as it's tall and skinny. So under all conditions, in general, I would say learn the TP fire lay and you can use it in the rain or sunshine. But... Right, you? Um, there's a YouTube channel called Corporal's Corner. Okay. And I learned a, a really quick fire light from him, and he likes to say that fire likes chaos. So he gets himself a big handful of, of sticks about this size that I showed you here, about the size of your finger and smaller, and he'll get about maybe this long, and he'll get three bundles about this big around. And he'll fill really one this way and one this way, sort of like two pieces of an A, and then one right on top. So what you have is a whole bunch of small sticks and a space that you can put your, your tinder. So does it look like an A from looking down? The letter A? Roughly. It's chaotic. It's a chaotic A. Okay. It's three bundles of sticks, roughly like this, like this, and like this. Okay. And then you stick, in, and there is a sort of a cave area, sort of like your, your um, TP fire, but a lot faster, 
and a lot easier to make. But then you take your fire bundle, like where you have your tinder, like blazing tinder, you stick it right in there, and the whole thing goes up. Okay. And a very similar one, uh, Morris Kohansky, one of the greatest survivalists of all time, greatest trainers. What he does up in um, in Canada, in, the, in Alaska, yeah. in the North Woods, he'll just get a great big bundle of sticks, very small tiny sticks, and lash them together into a big chaotic bundle like this. Stick some uh, birch bark in it because he has uh, access to birch bark. Yeah. Give it a couple of strikes with a sparrow rod. Poof, that thing goes up every time. In in, a, in wind and rain and everything, he swears by that. Wow. That's okay. So there, there you have it. But the best fire light windy is the one that works. <laughs> the one you know how to make. And the one you know how to make. Yeah. That's so what were the names of them again? Well, mine is TV fire light. And Corpus uh, Corner I is Corpus Corner. I don't know what he calls it. Uh, uh, three bundles. <laughs> three bundles in the shape of an egg. <laughs> and this one is called the drop log, the one that Rob came up with. So uh, we're going to give Rob credit for that because it uh, it does work. Now we just add if we want it or have a nice small fire. Yeah, you, you don't have to mess with this at all. Just let it burn down the coals and if you want to cook. If you don't want to cook, then you throw another log right on top. And so that then catches again. So it's just it's a really nice uniform, low maintenance fire. Good for marshmallows after, after the Facebook's over. Perfect. It's Corporal Corner? Corporal's Corner. C O R P O R A L S. Like Corporal. He was in the military. I can't remember the man's name. But uh, he is a student of Canterbury. Okay. All right. Cool. Okay, if there's no more questions, uh, what's coming up now? We do have our homesteading classes coming up in mid November. And you can, it's uh, over a series of uh, three days. Um, uh, you can take a soap making class on a Friday. You can take a canning class Saturday morning and a candle making class Saturday afternoon. And Sunday is wine making in the morning. And you get a wine kit to take home. And uh, cheese making, uh, mozzarella cheese and a hard cheese like cheddar or Colby will make in the afternoon. Or you can take any one of those individually. So you can take a group at a little bit of a discount or take them individually. So uh, that'll be, those classes will be held uh, just south of Cleveland in Seven Hills at our house here. And uh, see you there. Yep, yeah, see you there. Thank you for tuning in. And we're gonna be back uh, two Thursdays from now. And uh, remember, next Thursday is gonna be the end of the comp, uh, contest. And the following Thursday, we're gonna announce the winner. Again, I want to thank our international uh, viewers, Ruth, uh, and uh, thank you all for joining us.